Thank you, Rhonda, for taking part in this interview. Can you say something about the subject of the article and why you wrote it? Making Jamaican Love, it's, um, it's my use of literature. I wanted to think about, well, the whole, the, I wanted to think about how um, we could read literature in, in productive ways, right? So looking at literature as a lens to give us some insight into some um, extra literary issues. So this article looks at a romance, an erotic romance novel called uh, Waiting in Vain by Colin Channer from 1998. And um, I used it to think about or to to in, try to theorize about what uh, Jamaican people in diaspora um, how they use that novel, right? Um, it came to my attention, uh, I used to, you know, my, in the conference circuit, a lot of my friends were talking about it, and um, it's not the kind of book that academics tend to read more most often. So they were kind of joking about the some of the lines and some of the scenes. And then um, I read it myself, and I was joking about some of the lines and some of the scenes, but for some reason I started to look at the reviews of this um, book on Amazon.com, and there were about 400, almost 450 of them, and all of them were celebratory. They loved that book. And I started asking, you know, how is it that academics, you know, kind of thought it was funny and not a critical way, and the, like, a large number of people really loved it. So um, that was it. I was curious at the difference in the reception. So that's where I started, and um, I was always interested in different other kinds of popular fiction or genre fiction. Um, I wasn't very interested in romance, but after um, my um, interest in the other types of popular fiction started to grow, one of my colleagues in the English department, it was uh, Cynthia Young, suggested that I looked at romance because it's so popular. So that's what I did. So um, after I started doing the comparison with the Amazon.com reviews and my reading of the novel, it seemed to me that the readers or the people who wrote and posted those reviews were very interested in not just the main character, who was, his name is Adrian Fire Heath, not, so, not only um, in that character as an ideal and idealized lover, but also as an ideal and idealized Jamaican. And a lot of the reviews talked about how they needed to see that kind of representation of Jamaica and Jamaicanness. So they mined the novel for uh, t tools and different strategies on how to be that kind of Jamaican. And I think more importantly, project that kind of Jamaicanness to people who don't know, right? Um, so a lot of the reviews spoke to um, sharing the novel with non-Jamaicans and people so they could see their experience, their reality, their immigrant experience even. You make the point that the romance genre can offer insights into how Jamaicans living outside of Jamaica come to know themselves as Jamaican and as part of the Jamaican diaspora. Can you elaborate? There has been a lot of movement, I guess, on what it means to be in, in a diaspora and how people understand themselves as diaspora. And uh, one source that I used that was very helpful was Kim Butler's. Um, she talks about um, we need to identify what it means. And diaspora is a critical term um, and how folks understand themselves, right? So um, she argues that um, people... It's a process of, I guess, diasporization, that people come to know themselves as part of a diaspora. So they uh, have some kind of artistic claim on home. They have a uh, culinary claim on home, they cultural things that they claim. And they have to be connected politically. Um, even if they don't ever return physically, They those cultural aspects keep them connected. Um, so that process uh, is very important. And so it's not just being outside of your home country that makes you part of a diaspora, but sort of going through that process. And in reading the Amazon.com reviews, uh, it seemed to trigger that kind of process, that these folks understood that um, what they connected to in the novel was the representations of food traditions, the representation of cultural traditions, language, even the different locations that the, the novel talks about, um, Jamaicans moving into London and the U.S. and Canada. Those things resonated. And uh, they remarked, the reviewer, the people the reviews themselves remarked on how um, the novel spoke to that process, 
Um, and that's what they cl uh, claimed when they appreciated the novel, in addition to the romantic parts. Is there a connection between the arguments in your first book and those in this article? Wholly accidental. I didn't realize I made it until another colleague in the English department, Chris Wilson, kind of told me about it. My first book was on Panama Canal workers from the Caribbean, um, as they're written about in literature, song, and memoir. And I started by I started reading the literature, and the rep, the canal worker comes up often, and he's often an, an ancestral figure. Um, he comes back with money to set up shops, and he's a lover. Um, but when I started doing the background research about the construction of the canal um, under U.S. and under France, I found that um, the black workers from the Caribbean were mainly exploited labor. So there, there was nothing in that experience inherently that should have led to such veneration, I think, in the literature. So I argued that the literature seemed to capture the imaginable truths of canal migration, what could have been possible in migrating, um, despite sort of a physical reality or historical reality of exploited labor. And so uh, Chris Wilson asked me, he, he saw that my interest in popular fiction was do, trying to do similar work. Look at the ways that literature or literary studies can add insight into or add to conversations about um, mo events or ideas that occur in different disciplines, like history, for example, and puts it in conversation so we can get a broader uh, experience of uh, any particular moment, right? So Panama Canal migration, and in this this article, um, diaspora, understanding oneself as part of a diaspora. So I guess I'm always interested in how one uses literature and what insights literary studies can bring to larger conversations. What motivated you to study popular fiction, specifically romance literature, as an academic subject? I wanted, well, I didn't, it, it's purely accidental again. I, I, I didn't want, popular fiction was my pleasure reading, um, and I didn't want it to be work. I wanted to have a very sh stark distinction between what was work and what was not. Um, but the more I read, the more, I guess I read it the way I read um, the more critically dense works like, um, you know, the Morrisons and the Alice Walkers and George Lamings. And as I started doing that, I was like, this, this, this type of genre fiction has a lot of interesting stuff in it. Um, and it's packaged in a way that's accessible. You know, it's not, it, and it's broadly read. People like reading these things. So um, it's sort of, I think I've read or, and heard people talk about Bollywood films in the same way, or Nollywood films, the Nigerian versions of those, um, where they have broad access and appeal, and, and we need to sort of figure out what people get. Um, particularly for these kinds of um, sources that are circulating among such a broad group of people. So I wanted to read it. And I guess that goes back to my use of the Amazon.com reviews as well, because I wanted to look at um, sources that the people who are reading Waiting in Vain, for example, might use to get a uh, sh better handle on this kind of novel. So. Um, op-ed pieces in newspapers and magazines, write-ups in newspapers and magazines, and, and Amazon.com reviews, websites. Um, I use the Romance Writers of America website. I wanted to get use sources that complemented the genre fictions that I, were, I was looking at. So I, I had, and you also, you know, I had to couch the information that I got or put it in conversation with other types of critical sources. Um, because we, we encourage our students not to use, you know, the internet without uh, critically assessing the value of the source. But So I put those, what I found on the websites and in Amazon.com reviews and um, Wikipedia I even used for this article, I put it in conversation to other sources that define form and that kind of thing. Um, but I also, like I said, I wanted to use the sources that were most accessible, accessible to the people who might be reading this novel. Very useful. Rhonda, what role can literary studies play in extra literary studies? I'm thinking in particular of such disciplines as sociology, history, etc. 
I was, uh, I'm teaching a class this semester called Popular Fictions in the Americas, and yesterday, for example, we read uh, a short story by uh, a Caribbean Canadian writer named Nalo Hopkinson called A Habit of Waste. And the first scene of the novel, um, the protagonist, her name is Cynthia, she's sitting on a bus, and she, she was about to fall asleep, and she comes awake really quickly because somebody wearing her old body um, gets on the bus. And she's just like, she was shocked because she got rid of that body. She saved for five years um, to afford the procedure where she can download her consciousness into the body of her choice. Um, the body that she left behind was a black woman's body, um, very curvy, big hips, big backside. And she was stunned that somebody would, she didn't believe that somebody would choose that body because she um, attached a lot of negative meanings to the way that her body looked. And the body that she downloaded her consciousness into was a tall, thin, skinny white woman. Um, it was called, the character, the, the type was called a Diana, um, boyish, boyish grace or something. And so when her, someone wearing her body got on the bus, she was like, she must have gotten it by accident or she couldn't afford anything better. But the woman wearing her old body clearly appreciated the body, right? She dressed and behaved and carried herself with such a confidence that um, Cynthia had to rethink what her body meant and her, old, her relationship to her old body. Um, but she was able to remark on things that she could not remark on when she had the body herself, like how her skin was burnished gold and the way she, uh, the colors that look good on the new body and the clothes that the woman chose to wear and the appreciation the bus driver gave to the woman in her old body. So the, the whole story was about um, sort of coming to grips with who one is uh, in light of the outside, what the outside world says about who you're supposed to be and what's supposed to be attractive. And when we were in class, I wanted the students to think about it. It's, like, it's one thing to just say that we are inundated with images that tell us what normal is, right? And if you don't, if you're not normal in, in the ways that dominant culture tells you that you are normal, you strive to be that. You might lighten your skin, you might straighten your hair, you might exercise so that you, your curves you diminish or whatever. You try to uh, achieve what our society says is normal. But in a fantasy story um, where one can actually leave one's body and go into another's body and then see your body outside of yourself, that gives you some insights that you wouldn't have by just having a conversation. Or if um, somebody did a media studies, for example, and said, you know, statistically speaking, you know, the, the media tells us that we're supposed to look like this. So it gives you different access, right, and diff different critical insights. Um, and I think it, it, it elaborates on, and I think it's complementary to um, different disciplines' discussion of body image and um, so the social controls and media studies and that we get from the media, that kind of thing. Um, but I think that because it's literature, it's encouraging us to imagine what the world could be like if we didn't have these things or if we could change these things. And then I argue what I'm hoping to explore in the class is that if we can imagine differently, then different behaviors might result, right? Different kinds of thinking, different, different relationships to what we consider normal now. Uh, Walter Mosley uh, wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times um, some years ago, it was about 1990 something, 98 I think, where he says that um, not only should black people read more science fiction, he was talking about science fiction, but they should write more because he says, I think the quote, direct quotation is that we make up and then we make real. Um, he argues that there, there aren't the sort of what we take for granted now in terms of technologies were once imagined, right? Fictional flights of fancy is the phrase that he uses. And if we can, he, so he values very much how, what it means to imagine differently and then the behaviors that result from imagining differently. So that's a, um, it, for me, literature and literary studies of all kinds, but um, genre fictions in particular, it's encouraging us to think our world differently and hopefully um, from that thinking, we have different behaviors that will result. So um, and that, for me, that's most important. We need to enliven our imaginations and then behave differently.
I think that some may be intrigued by your use of Amazon reviews. Arguably, there is a stigma uh, about the use of such reviews in academic uh, study. However, you use them very successfully as tools. Uh, how did you go about using these Amazon reviews? It was a process. Oh, so, okay, so this article went through different iterations, right? I started off as a um, conference paper. Um, I taught my class uh, popular fictions in the Americas, and I used this novel. And then it turned into an article. And in those different iterations, I got different things from it. So when in conference, um, in conference presentations, the, uh, the, my colleagues and the audience appre appreciated what, I guess what I spoke about earlier about the ways that, um, the difference between sort of an academic approach to a romance novel versus a popular approach. So we understood the Amazon.com reviews as being written by people. Um, and we also understood that those people were who they said they were in their reviews. Um, but when I got to the uh, article or the journal article stage of this um, piece, uh, the external reviewers for the journal, they asked me to think about whether I could justly say that those were in fact people and who those people were, right? So just because you said in an Amazon.com review that you were Jamaican and you know this because you're Jamaican, I shouldn't have taken it for granted that they were in fact Jamaican. Um, it, and I was uh, a little surprised because it didn't come up ever. I, I gave it as a conference paper a couple of times and nobody ever mentioned that. So after I started thinking about it, and then I think there was a New York Times article that spoke to um, sort of this new trend in people actually buying reviews for, for these kinds of sites like Amazon.com. Um, so it puts the identity of the writer into question. But what I did in this article is focus on the content of the reviews. So I, so I did more of sort of a content analysis of what they said, how many times these things were said, and put them into sort of categories. So the content of the reviews, um, the categories came across as um, people who appreciated the, the romantic form, people who were appreciated specific characters, or in the relationship between specific characters, and then people who appreciated sort of the ways that the Caribbean or black people generally, Jamaicans and black men in particular, were represented in the novel. Um, I, but I still think it's important to, oh, and so even in sort of focusing on content and not who, the person who wrote the reviews, um, the, con the, the reviews that were most useful for my argument were the ones um, that were supposed to have been written by people who said that they had some connection to the Caribbean. Um, but fortunately, in they, they actually talked about that in the review, so I could still focus on the uh, the content, what was written in them, um, and then still uh, organize them into the categories that were very useful. Um, but in the larger piece, when I work on this some more into my next book project, I'm going to have to deal with who writes. Um, and then I'll have more time for actual, try to reach out to these folks. Because um, for Amazon.com, you often have email addresses and this kind of thing. So I have to try to reach out to these people. But I'm interested in who wrote the reviews and how they specifically relate to popular fiction. So um, there's a really good study on that Janice Radway wrote on um, uh, middle class white women who read romance novels. It was very interesting, I thought. So I might have to work on something like that. What is the audience for the study of the uses of genre fiction? I'm hoping it's large. Um, mm -hmm. I'm hoping I can attract an academic audience clearly, but I'm also hoping to be in conversation with a larger, uh, like popular fiction fans, for example. Um, so I want it to be more popular, more accessible to a different range of people. Uh, another chapter in this, this second project that I'm working on is based on um, op-ed pieces. So this, the, this uh, Colin Channer um, our chapter is going to be, you know, romance fiction and diaspora. Um, another chapter uh, is going to be on fantasy literature and multiculturalism in Canada. And in that piece, um, the sources that I'm using are op-ed pieces to different local newspapers. Nalo Hopkinson has a novel called Brown Girl in the Ring, which is set in a post-apocalyptic Toronto. 
and it represents uh, the, I guess, the, one of the defining scenes that I'm talking about is where the protagonist named Tijon, she's able to channel Yoruba gods through Canada CN Tower. And that ownership, of she, so she's a, this, she's a child of Caribbean immigrants to, to Toronto. And her claim on the city um, through that process, I guess, of her spiritual process of owning the CN Tower in that way, spoke to me about what it meant to be an immigrant in um, the host city. And the Multiculturalism Act, which defined Canada as a multicultural country, um, was the intention was to define Canada as a multicultural country, but in practice, there's some difficulty, right? So you had some people not being included much at all, the indigenous, indigenous people in Canada, and then some people fighting against making Canada less white, right? So to see the child of Caribbean immigrants in Canada claim the space so assertively, I, want, I started asking questions about how this novel might help us think about multiculturalism in Canada differently. So if the child of an immigrant can be so wholly Canadian while still holding on to Caribbean and African diasporic traditions, particularly spiritual traditions, I'm thinking it can add a lot to the conversation about the, um, what some have argued are the divisive effects of multiculturalism in Canada. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm hoping to do. So it seems that your next project is very much a continuation of this present work. Absolutely, absolutely. I have, um, they're gonna, each chapter is based on a different um, genre form, um, genre fiction form. So one is, you know, the romance novel, fantasy novel, and um, multiculturalism in Canada. There's a really good police procedural that I'm using for another chapter, um, Patrick Chamoiseau's Solibo Magnificent. It's a, it's a, it's about, well, what, the death of culture, right? Chamoiseau's a protagonist, Solibo's a storyteller, and he dies because he chokes on the word. Um, and then the police come and try to figure out what killed him. Um, and so we're focusing on police procedure, um, but it, the, Chamoiseau uses that form to explore modernization in um, Martinique and uh, the death of, or the so-called death of traditional cultures, like storytelling, for example. So it's very interesting. It's a really nice novel. And then there's um, a novel called Charisma by Stephen Barnes. He's a, it's a thriller. And it's about um, a man who's a Renaissance man, a black guy named Marcus, Alexander Marcus. And some scientists have figured out a way. I guess it's, this one's kind of, um, it struggles against different kinds of form, uh, form definitions of form because it's thrillery, it's sort of sci-fi, fantasy sort of. Anyway, so Marcus, the, some the scientists have figured out how to capture his essence and then imbue it in underprivileged youth, right? Because to give them a chance to be who Marcus is. But what they don't know is that Marcus is also a serial killer. So they're figured out that they imbued that into the kids. So somebody's killing the kids, and then the kids fight back. It's really amazing. But I'm using that novel to, to, to help us think about what it means to fix people, right? Because it, it, it implies that these people are damaged, these young people um, and these poor kids, because they're young, poor, and of color. And that somebody, somebody decides that they need fixing. And then in fixing them, they made them worse in some ways. So I want to use that thriller novel to sort of interrogate what it means to define people in these ways and then to fix when, you know, perhaps there's nothing that needs fixing. Um, so that's the one I'm working on now. And uh, Barbara Neely's novels, uh, Blanche, her Blanche White series, I want to look at the detective, mystery detective form to look at race, what blackness means, and um, how that form can be a vehicle to explore it. Rhonda, is there anything you'd like to say in conclusion? I, I didn't want to make genre fiction my job because I was afraid then that I would have no more pleasure reading, right? I would, mm -hmm. Everything would be work. But gee, I don't know, hopefully you can see how excited I am by this new project and how I still have the same kind of attraction to these 
these books as I did when I first read them just for pleasure. So I've learned that I can have both, right? It can be work and it can be pleasure at the same time. And I'm hoping that in the writing of this new book, I can convey the enthusiasm that I have. And I convey it in such a way that it's, it's accessible to a large group of readers.